today we're going to talk about the nervous system. This is a fairly long detailed system, so you may want to go through and go through this in two separate settings if you're looking at going through for your first time. With the nervous system, we divide it up into two major divisions, the CNS and the PNS. Your CNS is your central nervous system. This will include the brain and spinal cord. These structures are encased in bone. The peripheral nervous system is going to include all of the nerves branching off of the spinal cord as well as the cranial nerves. Functions of the nervous system, it's going to have sensory functions. They're going to perceive stimuli going on in the body or the environment. Motor functions, they're going to send a message out to carry out a response. And integrative functions, these are going to process the information from the body and determine the appropriate response. So the image you see here is an illustration of a brain and then a cerebellum behind it with the brain stem. There is not a big gaping space here. I just like the image because it's simple and easy to see. Down below, you've got some illustrations of some neurons. They do take on different shapes. So some of them are more pyramidal shapes, some are more circular shape, and various other shapes. So looking at how the nervous system is organized, You've got the CNS and the PNS. Within the PNS, we divide that up into two subsystems. The somatic nervous system, which is going to be things that are under voluntary control in the body, things that you'll have conscious awareness of. And then the autonomic nervous system, which is going to be things that you do not have conscious awareness of or conscious control of. It happens automatically. With the autonomic nervous system, it will operate in one of two modes. The sympathetic mode is your fight or flight mode. This is going to be under a high stress situation. The parasympathetic is your rest and digest mode. This is what you should be functioning in most of the time. So when we look at the parts of the neuron, the cell body is going to contain the nucleus. So here is just a general illustration of a neuron here. It's a motor neuron for an example. The dendrite is going to be the receiving end. It will receive messages and carry them towards the cell body. The axon is the sending end. It's going to take messages away from the cell body. When you have a neuron meet up with another neuron or another tissue that it's going to talk to, it will form a synapse, which is the site of communication. Your neuroglia are support cells. Their job is to nourish and protect the neurons. Neurons do not generally heal very well, if at all. So we have a lot of neuroglia that are there with the primary purpose is protecting the neurons. A myelin sheath is a fatty protective sheath that you'll see around a neuron. It's made up of the fatty acid DHA. And you can see this neuron here is illustrated to have myelin. The nodes of Ranvier are the little spaces between the sections of myelin. Schwann cells are going to form the myelin sheath and the PNS. They are one of the support cells. We do have myelin in some of the CNS. That's going to be formed by oligodendrocytes. The neurolemma is a thin sheath that's going to surround a nerve cell. Another type of support cell we have is the astrocyte. They're called this because of their star shape. They'll provide physical and metabolic support. And then the microglia are going to be immune cells of the nervous system. So when we have clusters of cells together that are myelinated, we refer to it as the white matter. The gray matter is going to be the unmyelinated cells. They are named that because the white matter is a little bit lighter in color, the gray matter is a little bit darker in color. Neither one are truly white or gray. They're just basically a lighter beige and a darker beige. So in creating the action potential, when we say a neuron is polarized, it means it has membrane potential. The inside of the cell is relatively negative compared to the outside of the cell. This is created using these sodium potassium pumps. If you look on a battery, you'll notice that one end of it is relatively positive, one end is relatively negative. That separation of charges is what allows the bot battery to do work for us. It's going to be the same thing 
with your cells when they have separation of charges allowing those charges to come back together is when it will do work for you your resting membrane potential is the voltage across the plasma membrane it just happens to be a small battery at negative 70 millivolts but you have a lot of them the stimulus is going to be what changes the resting potential it's like what turns your device that's controlled by the battery on and off. Your threshold is the critical level of depolarization. This is at about 55 millivolts. That's where depolarization is going to occur. This is how much stimulus it's going to take. If there isn't enough stimulus to reach the threshold, it's not going to turn on or send the message. So when the separated charges come together, we say this is depolarizing. Repolarizing is when you separate the charges across the membrane again. So it's like a rechargeable battery. You can have it discharge and recharge back up. <clears throat> this diagram here is going to show you here the time period that this happens. So you've got negative 70 millivolts. Here you will have the sodium channels open, it's going to depolarize, and then it will repolarize again and be ready to go again. So we say that they work on the all or none principle. So as long as the depolarization is strong enough to reach the threshold, the sodium and potassium gates are going to open and the action potential is going to occur. And the peak is always the same. It's never going to halfway send the message. So when the message is conducted, it is going to travel a little bit differently in myelinated and unmyelinated neurons. So in unmyelinated axons, it's going to be a little bit slower. You have continuous conduction. It has to depolarize all the way along the membrane. Slower means these can go up to about 10 meters per second. It's still pretty quick. With saltatory conduction, this will occur in myelinated axons. It's much faster. It's able to bypass the area where it has the myelin. It only has to depolarize in the spots in between the myelin. This can go up to about 100 meters per second. So if you're interested in how these resting potentials are calculated, there's some information here on the Nernst equation. Um, I can honestly say I've never had to use it for anything. It's there more just to satisfy your curiosity. So when we look at synaptic transmission, the neuron that is going to be before the synapse or delivering the stimulus to the synapse is the presynaptic neuron. The postsynaptic neuron is going to be on the other side receiving the stimulus from the synapse. You can have multiple neurons in a line, so it may be presynaptic in one relationship and postsynaptic in the next relationship. So your impulse is going to travel down that presynaptic neuron at the presynaptic end and depolarize. When it gets to the synapse, the neurotransmitter will be released, and then the postsynaptic neuron will depolarize. So with neurotransmitters here, we have little bits of information on neurotransmitters. These are not fully understood. A lot of times what we've learned with neurotransmitters is when we have had pharmaceutical agents that may mimic or block them, and we figure out when we put them in the body some other places where they have an effect. So what you're learning in here is just kind of some key features for the neurotransmitters. So the first group is the small molecule neurotransmitters. First one is glutamate. It's an amino acid. It's excitatory, which means it's going to turn something on. It plays possible roles in learning and memory, as well as potentially being involved with Alzheimer's and epilepsy. You may see learning, memory, and some of these functions will be influenced by multiple neurotransmitters. These are very complex functions in the body, and so there's more than one thing involved with controlling them. Aspartate is also an amino acid. This one is excitatory as well. 
GABA is gamma amino butyric acid. This one's inhibitory, so it's going to block things or shut them down. It's only found in the CNS. Some of the anti-anxiety medications like diazepam or Valium will enhance the action of GABA. ACH is acetylcholine. This is found in a lot of the peripheral nervous system and some of the central nervous system. Depending on where it's at, it can be excitatory or inhibitory. In the parasympathetic nervous system, it's going to slow the heart rate down. What it will do is inhibit sympathetic stimulation to slow down the heart rate. It's cholinergic because it will attach to choline receptors. It's involved with cognitive functions, memory, Alzheimer's, digestion, saliva. Certain antidepressants that would target this neurotransmitter would have dry mouth as a side effect because of its role in saliva production. Other small molecule amines, there's various amino acids, the biogenic amines, ATP, nitric oxide, other purines like ADP and AMP can act as excitatory neurotransmitters in the CNS and PNS. So there are several chemicals that can actually act as neurotransmitters. Biogenic amines are made from modified amino acids. So a big group of these are the catecholamines. They're going to include norepinephrine, dopamine, and epinephrine. They all have an amine group on them and a catechol ring, which is another chemical group. They're synthesized from the amino acid tyrosine, and they're broken down by the enzyme catechol o methyltransferase or monoamine oxidase. I mention this in here because these have potential risk for drug interactions when you look at medications that alter these. So you may see the warning on a drug to do not take with monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs. And the reason for that is you only have so much of the enzyme if it's all busy breaking down this from one drug and you throw in something else, you can overload the system. With norepinephrine, this one's involved with arousal, dreams, moods. It's made from a modified amino acid, so it's a monoamine. It's found in the pons, thalamus, midbrain, and midbrain. It's involved with sympathetic responses. So all of your sympathetic responses will involve norepinephrine. It will affect heart rate, gastrointestinal activity, and it is affected by the MAOIs. Also, the tricyclic antidepressants. So some brain neurons will use epinephrine. The adrenal medulla uses both norepinephrine and epinephrine. Dopamine, this is one involved with emotional responses, addiction, pleasure, regulating skeletal muscle tone. This is the one involved with Parkinson's disease. Excesses of it are found in one form of schizophrenia. It's found in the basal ganglia. It's also a monoamine. So there is actually a lot of interesting information out there on dopamine with addiction and forming habits. So glycine, this is inhibitory. Serotonin, this one's involved with sensory perception, temperature regulation, mood, appetite, onset of sleep. It's made from tryptophan. So the supplement 5-HTP or 5-hydroxytryptophan can alter levels of this. If a person is taking a serotonin reuptake inhibitor drug, they need to use a lot of caution if they're going to take that supplement. It's probably not a good idea. Um, St. John's wort is another thing that will affect levels of this. So just because they are a natural product doesn't mean they can't potentially have interactions with other drugs or cause damage. It's also involved with pain perception, blood pressure, hormone activity. It's found in the cerebral cortex and spinal cord. It's concentrated in the raffi nucleus of the brain, also found in the gastrointestinal and cardiovascular system. So some of the illegal drugs like ecstasy will actually trigger massive releases of serotonin. Serotonin sickness can be very serious and potentially fatal for a person. So they're not really a good idea to play around with. So nitric oxide, 
This is different than laughing gas, that's nitrous oxide. It's involved with learning and memory. It's widespread in the body. The enzyme nitric oxide synthase catalyzes the formation of this from arginine. Unlike other neurotransmitters which are prepackaged, this is going to be produced on demand and is going to act immediately. It's highly reactive, so it exists for less than 10 seconds before it's going to combine with water and oxygen to make your active nitrites and nitrates. It's lipid soluble and then it will diffuse to neighboring cells. So it activates enzymes for a second messenger system. They discovered it in 1987 in the blood vessels and endothelial cells. They'll release the nitric oxide into neighboring cells and it will call, cause the smooth muscle relaxation or vasodilation. So the effects will decrease blood pressure, but this is also the mechanism that's used to increase an erection, erection in Viagra. So nitric oxide is toxic to phagocytic cells. So some neuropeptides, we have substance P that's found in sensory neurons and the spinal cord. It's used for pain perception. The enkephalins are going to inhibit pain. They're going to suppress substance P. They may also play a role in learning, memory, body temperature, sexual activity, and be involved with mental illness. The endorphins, they're a natural painkiller. It may inhibit pain by suppressing substance P, involved with memory, learning, states of euphoria and pleasure, body temperature, sexual activity, and mental illness. So endorphin actually means endogenous morphine. So a lot of the opioids will actually target endorphin receptors. So what it will do is it's going to lower heart rate, respiration, metabolism in general. This is what animals do when they go into hibernation. Of course, if you overdose on those things, it sends you basically into a permanent hibernation or death. So the dimorphins, they may be related to pain control as well as registering emotions. We have hypothalamic releasing and inhibiting hormones that are going to regulate the anterior and posterior pituitary. These we look at more in the endocrine system. Angiotensin II stimulates thirst, regulates blood pressure and vasoconstriction, and promotes releasing aldosterone. So we look at this with the circulatory system. Cholecystokinin. It's in the brain and small intestine. It controls the release of bile and pancreatic enzyme secretions. It can send a signal to stop eating when a person is starting to feel satisfied. So we talk about this one more in the digestive system. So looking at the autonomic nervous system, when you're in the sympathetic mode, epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be the key neurotransmitters used. They're also going to come from the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is going to help to support the sympathetic response. So the nervous system will get the response started quickly, but the hormones coming from the adrenal medulla will help to prolong the response. The sympathetic trunk in your thoracic spine is going to have the nerves that are going to control the sympathetic responses. They'll all use norepinephrine. So in this image here, you can see you've got all of these organs and body parts here. They all have nerves that are going to come from the thoracic spine. These are your sympathetic fibers. They're going to deliver the sympathetic message. For the parasympathetics, you've got the cranial sacral control. They're going to exit the spine in the cranial region or the sacral region, and they will use acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. So all of these things are also going to get a message from the cranial sacral area. So depending on which mode you're in, you'll either have the sympathetic stimulation or the parasympathetic stimulation, but they all have connections to both. So when you look at the sympathetic and parasympathetic responses, they actually are very logical when you think about how they would support the body. In a sympathetic response, you're in fight or flight mode. Your pupils are going to dilate. This is going to allow more light in. Heart rate and blood pressure are going to increase. You want to get, increase the blood flow. Make sure you're sending it to skeletal muscle as well as to the brain. Airways are going to expand to be able to take in more oxygen. Blood flow will shift to skeletal muscle and the liver is going to break down its glycogen trying to have more energy available. 
in the parasympathetic response, heart rate and blood pressure are going to decrease. They're going to come back down to normal. Your lacrimal glands, which are the tear ducts, are going to increase. This is actually a function of maintenance of the eyes. Also, you may look at that and go, well, what about crying? Crying is a parasympathetic response. If you're in fight or flight mode and you're crying, having all those tears in the way is not going to help you to be able to breathe better or be able to see better, to be able to defend yourself. Pancreas is going to increase its digestive activities. Liver will switch into detoxification and fat processing mode. Pupils constrict. Digestion increases, the bladder prepares for urination, and blood flow is going to go to the digestive organs. So we should be spending the majority of our time in the parasympathetic mode. Whether or not that is the case probably depends a lot on lifestyle, and I think the majority of people have far too much stress to be healthy for their bodies. So the meninges are the membranes that surround the CNS. And we've got three layers to them. The outermost layer is the dura mater. It literally means hard mother. The middle layer is the arachnoid mater. It's a spider web type arrangement. And then the pia mater is the delicate innermost layer that's going to sit directly on the CNS. The space between the dura and pia mater is the subarachnoid space. And that's where you're going to have the arachnoid mater and cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. The spinal cord does not go all the way to the bottom. It goes down to about the level of L1. And the terminus of it is called the cauda equina. When you get down to that area, you'll have a thickened area called the conus medullaris. So in this picture up here, you can see the conus medullaris, this thickened area here, and the cauda equina are these fibers that are extending down from there. When a lumbar puncture is done, they want to make sure they go in below this so there's not a risk of damaging the spinal cord. If we take a cross section of a spinal cord, we can see where you're going to have this H-shaped area of gray matter, and then you'll have the white matter around it. So we have ventral and dorsal horns. Your ventral horn is going to be on the anterior side. It's going to have the motor fibers come in and out here. The dorsal horn on the posterior side is going to have the sensory fibers. These fibers come out to the side from both of them, and they're going to exit as the spinal nerves, carrying both motor and sensory fibers. The fibers that are going to go from the body to the brain, carrying sensory information, we refer to them as the ascending tract in the CNS. So the pathway of a nerve in the CNS is called a tract. The descending tract is going to go from the brain down to the body. It's going to carry motor fibers. Nerve pathways in the peripheral nervous system we, recall, we will refer to as a reflex. So a lot of times when a person pictures a reflex, they're thinking of a deep tendon reflex. That's a specific type of reflex, but the term reflex is more general, referring to just pathways in the PNS. So with a spinal reflex, you're going to have a sensory neuron, pick up the information, carry it to an inner neuron, and then deliver it to a motor neuron. It's called a spinal reflex because it involves a spinal nerve. The arc passes through the spinal cord. So your reflex arc is the pathway, all the pieces to the pathway. So the first step is you have a receptor at the end of a sensory neuron. It's going to react to a stimulus. So imagine you've got your hand. It's going to have sensory receptors in there. And you put your hand on the burner of a hot stove. The sensory neuron is going to conduct that impulse towards the CNS. It's going to travel through an afferent pathway. And then it will reach the integration center, where it's going to have one or more synapses in the CNS. One of those synapses is going to send that message up to your brain, but it's also going to connect immediately with a motor neuron that's going to conduct that nerve impulse along the efferent pathway, leaving the CNS to an effector. 
the effector is going to respond. So in our example of touching a hot burner, that's going to be the muscles in your arm that are going to pull your hand away. So most of us have done something like this where it may not have been a hot burner, but you touch something else painful and you immediately pull your hand away and you realize you've pulled your hand away before you actually experience the pain. That's the difference in the time of just a short distance sending that message to the muscle to respond before it gets up to your brain for you to be able to perceive the pain and decide what you're going to do. So it's there as a self-preservation mechanism for us. If you had to wait for that message to get up to your brain and you go, oh, that really hurts. That's burning my hand. I should pull it away before I cause too much damage. A whole lot more damage is going to happen in that time frame than you quickly responding and pulling your hand away. So the effector, it may be a muscle or it could be a gland and then secrete a product. So cranial reflexes, they'll involve cranial nerves. So somatic reflexes, these are ones where the effector is a skeletal muscle. We have autonomic or visceral reflexes where the effector is a smooth muscle or a gland. We can have stretch reflexes where you have the contraction of a skeletal muscle in response to stretching. This can actually be useful in certain types of therapy. If a person is having difficulty contracting a muscle, they can do a fast stretch on there to try and stimulate the muscle to contract. Deep tendon reflexes, these cause relaxation to prevent tendon tear. So there's tension applied to the tendon and it gets the message sent that there's some really fast tension coming on here and it will actually inhibit the motor neuron and cause the muscle to relax because it's afraid it's going to contract too quickly and cause damage. So with the spinal nerves, they're going to exit through the IVF or intervert intervertebral foramina. So here on this picture, you've got two vertebrae. This little space here that's created between these two bones together on the side is the intervertebral foramina and that's where the spinal nerve is going to exit. So endoneurium is going to be the membrane that surrounds that peripheral nerve and it will be mixed because it's going to carry both motor and sensory information. Some of the time when the nerves come out they're going to form a plexus where they will recombine after they exit the spinal cord. For example here this is a brachial plexus. You have nerves coming out of the spinal cord here and you'll notice as you follow this one you have part of the fibers from this one merge and then they'll divide off and this is going to have some fibers from up here and they recombine. It is not random how they recombine. I actually like this picture for showing it that's color coordinated. So you'll have them come out they will recombine to make your trunks, your divisions, your cords, your branches, and then finally your peripheral nerve. So they do have names at all of these levels. In this class, I'm more concerned that you know what a plexus is, the idea of a plexus, and a brachial plexus is a common one, but you're not going to be expected to memorize all the parts of the brachial plexus. We do have other plexuses, the cervical plexus from C1 to C5. Brachial plexus is that big one, C5 to T1. We have the lumbar plexus, L1 to L4, sacral plexus, the L4 and 5, and then S1 to S4, and the coccygeal plexus that is S4 and 5 and coccygeal nerves. So dermatomes, these are going to be the paired spinal nerves or the trigeminal nerve for the face that's going to provide sensory information to the CNS from the skin. So the nerve pattern serving the skin is different than the nerve pattern to the body and tissues underneath. So looking at the brain, we have five major regions to it. Here we have the brain stem. It's going to include the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. Above this area here, you have the diencephalon. It's going to include your thalamus, hypothalamus, and pineal gland. The brain stem here is going to be what connects to the spinal cord. The cerebrum is this entire, entire area above the brain stem and diencephalon. On the outside of it, we have gray matter that we refer to as the cerebral cortex. And then the cerebellum is going to be this area here posterior to the brain stem.
So your CSF is cerebral spinal fluid. It is clear. It should be transparent. Um, it does have a slight pigment to it if you hold it up in front of a white piece of paper. It's not totally clear like water, but if you're just holding it up in the air, it's going to look like water. It's going to carry oxygen and glucose and then remove waste. Your blood-brain barrier is a protective barrier that lipid-soluble substances are able to pass, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and ethanol. Most anesthesias can pass, but it can be damaged by trauma. So you want to keep this protective barrier intact. While having an infection in the blood is very serious, having it get into the brain is extremely serious and life-threatening. The ventricles are the cavities in the brain, and we can see those in the blue parts of this picture here. So you have a, one that is C-shaped on each side. Those are the first and second ventricles. The third ventricle is in the middle, and then the fourth ventricle is also in the middle down below. So the choroid plexus is a special capillary in the fourth ventricle. This is going to produce cerebral spinal fluid. So what basically happens is some of the fluid is going to ooze out through the capillary walls to form cerebral spinal fluid. The arachnoid villi are little finger-like extensions in the arachnoid mater. They're going to help to absorb some of the CSF back into the blood. They absorb about 15% back. The majority of it is going to go back through the superior sagittal sinus. That's a vein that is going to drain that CSF. And it's going to be on the superior sagittal line. So looking in a little more detail at the brain stem, we have the medulla oblongata. It's going to have sensory and motor tracts pass through here. It's got a cardiovascular center. It will control heart rate, vasodilation. There's rhythmicity centers for breathing. There is a vomiting center. Controls deglutition, which is swallowing. Coughing, sneezing, hiccups are controlled in this area. All of the brain stem is controlling vital functions that help keep you alive. You don't have conscious control over these, <coughs> which is really probably in our best interest, since if they are damaged, we're not going to survive on our own. So with the vomiting center here, this is one of the reasons sometimes with a upper cervical injury, a person can have vomiting that will go with it. The pons, pons means bridge. It's going to be a relay station for the tracks. So it will help to control breathing as well. There are going to be nuclei of cranial nerves 5, 6, 7, and 8, which are just collections of neuron cell bodies and relays. So you can think of it as kind of like being a relay handoff for a running race. The nerve is going to pass the information from one neuron to the next neuron. The midbrain will connect the pons to the diencephalon. It's going to have more motor and sensory connections. There's a little dark area in there called the substantia nigra that releases dopamine. This is where Parkinson's disease occurs. It's one of the areas involved with consciousness and sleep. Certain visual reflexes will go through here, the auditory pathway, and your startle re reflexes in here. So auditory with hearing going through here and your startle reflex, that's why alarm clocks are generally going to use a sound to wake you up. In the diencephalon, we have the thalamus. It's a big relay station. It's involved with the acquisition of knowledge and cognition and also helping to maintain consciousness. This is where things go from being something you have to think about step by step to something you're able to do almost automatically. If you think about when you first learned how to drive, you stop to think about the steps of the process a lot more. You thought about where you put the key in, you looked at the key to make sure you had the right key, put on the seat belt, checked the mirrors, looked around in the car, is everything set where you like it? Today, when you drive to go somewhere, you probably remember very little of the process between getting in your car and ending up where you want to be. This is why you can, on your days off, you go out and you get in your car and you're not really concentrating on things and you may find that, oops, I drove to work that day when it was your day off. When things become very familiar with that, they will go through what we call a direct activation pathway in the brain. It's like getting on express lanes.
you get on, there's not a lot of exits to think about, you get off at the other end. When you're first learning how to do something, you have to take the back roads. So there's a lot more pathways and connections you have to make. You've probably been told at some point, don't change your answer on a test, trust what comes through first. If you have studied it, it's more likely to move into the direct activation pathway and come to you first. It's when you decide that you're going to take conscious control and navigate the back ways to double check things that you have the potential for error. So there actually is some real reasoning behind that saying, do not change your answers on a test. The hypothalamus, this is going to control the autonomic nervous system. So this, in turn, will end up controlling your smooth and cardiac muscle because they're under autonomic control. This is going to control the pituitary, which is going to control the release of several other hormones. Emotion and behavior are in here, things like rage, aggression, pain, pleasure, sexual emotions. Eating and drinking. So thirst is actually a response to a change in the osmotic pressure of the cerebral spinal fluid, hunger, body temperature, it will help to direct blood flow. When you're warm, it's gonna send blood flow out to the surface of the skin. When you're cold, it's gonna pull it in towards the co core of your body. If you've ever wondered why you can take a car ride someplace, you get out, maybe you're going to play in the snow, you get out, it's cold, you put all those extra clothes on, and as soon as you get all those clothes on, you gotta to run to the bathroom. What's happened is you got cold, it pulls all that blood flow in, you need to displace some of the fluid. And it gets displaced through urine. And then your circadian rhythms, wake and sleep cycles are also going to be influenced by this area. The pineal gland, gonna be just below here, it's gonna produce melatonin, which will also affect those biorhythms for wake and sleep cycle. Light is going to inhibit the production, which will allow for more of a waking state. Darkness will allow the production of melatonin, and that will promote more of a sleeping state. So we do naturally tend to want to get up with the daylight and sleep in the dark. The Haber nuclei, this area is going to have clusters of nuclei that are involved with olfaction and emotional responses. So we think the reason that you can have emotional responses and memories be tr triggered by certain smells is the close proximity of where they are located together in the brain. The cerebellum, its job is to smooth and coordinate movements. It will be involved with your balance and posture. It's gonna take sensory information from your tendons, your joints, equilibrium from the inner ear, and visual impulses, and it's going to coordinate all of that information together. So when we look at the cerebrum, the gyri are going to be the raised parts of the folds, and the sulci are the depressions in the folds. So while they look like they are random on here, that there was just too much brain and it had to get squeezed a little bit to fit in the head, they are not random, they all have a name and a purpose. Inside the brain, on the two halves, you've got a band of fibers, the corpus callosum, that will connect the right and left hemispheres. So your frontal lobe is going to be in the front here. It's going to be your primary motor area. So here in your pre-central gyrus, this is where you're going to initiate movement from. The parietal lobe, this is the somatosensory area. This post-central gyrus will be where you have your sensory information be first perceived. And then in the back, we've got the occipital lobe, which is going to have your visual area. And then the temporal lobe here on the sides, it's auditory and olfactory. The olfactory bulbs from your nose are going to have a short track to the medial part of it. Makes sense, nose is in the middle of your face. The auditory area will go into more of the lateral temporal lobe, which your ears are on the side of your head. It's going to be closer. We have a couple of specialized areas that are for language. 
that are primarily on the left side. So Wernicke's area is going to do with interpreting spoken word. So it's not really about hearing it, but understanding what is said to you. Broca's area is involved with producing speech, sensible speech. So it's not about making the noise, but actually conveying the meaning in the speech. So the way the blood flow of the brain works, these two areas are commonly affected by strokes. And so if a person cannot understand what's being said to them, we say they have a Wernicke's aphasia. If they are not producing sensible speech, they have a Broca's aphasia. And they can have both of them occur together where they do not make any sense and they don't understand anything. So your basal ganglia, they're actually nuclei because they're in the CNS. Ganglia typically occur outside in the CNS. They're deep within the cerebral hemispheres. They're going to receive input from the cerebral hemispheres and send output back to the motor area through the thalamic nuclei. This will help in initiating and terminating movements. They can influence sensory, limbic, cognitive, linguistic functions, influence Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. So basically, it's a way for parts of the brain to communicate and give feedback to each other so that our activities are coordinated. Your limbic system, this region's involved with emotions, also olfaction, memory, extreme pleasure and pain, fear, aggression, and expressing appropriate emotions. So the electroencephalogram is a way of us being able to measure brain waves. It's going to look at electrical activity. So alpha waves are 8 to 13 hertz. These are seen in normal individuals when they're awake or resting with their eyes closed. Beta waves are 14 to 30 hertz. This is when the nervous system is active it's during sensory input, mental activity. So this is what you should see when you are taking a test. Theta waves, they're 4 to 7 hertz. These are normal in children. You see them in adults during emotional distress and with many brain disorders. And then delta waves are 1 to 5 hertz. This is what's seen in adults during deep sleep. It's normal in an awake infant. If you see this in an awake adult, it's going to indicate brain damage. So while the hemispheres of the brain appear symmetrical, they're not exactly symmetrical in function. So your left hemisphere is going to control somatosensory information on the right side. The information crosses to the other side of the body. Right hemisphere will control somatosensory on the left side. The left hemisphere is more involved with things like reasoning, numerical and scientific skills, sign language, spoken and written language, where the right side is more involved with music, artistic awareness, spatial and pattern perception, being able to compare mental images to spatial relationships, recognizing faces and emotional expression, identifying and discriminating odors, and the emotional content of language. So we all do have both sides of the brain. We do use both of them, although for some people they may have a slight dominance of one side over the other. So for the cranial nerves, there are 12 of them. There are several mnemonics out there that you can find in your textbooks or online that help you remember them. They all have a name and a Roman numeral. Fortunately, when you identify them on a brain, they go from front to back, anterior to posterior, so it makes it a little bit easier to identify them. So cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, Olfaction is your sense of smell. Cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve. This is the one that's going to actually carry the visual impulses to the back of the brain. Vision takes a lot of optic nerve power. Cranial nerve 3 is also involved with vision, the oculomotor nerve. It's going to involve eyelid movement, eyeball movement, and pupil constriction. So one of the ways that we test for this is to shine the light in the eye. You should see both pupils constrict because that reflex should be connected on both sides of the brain. Cranial nerve 4, the trochlear nerve. 
that is also going to control eyeball movement and mechanoreception. Mechanoreception is knowing where your body parts are in space. If you reach your hand behind your back, you can feel that it's behind your back. You don't have to go look in the mirror and see where did it go. Cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve. This is going to spread out over the face. So there's three branches to it, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. This will be involved with touch, pain, temperature, mechanoreception, and chewing. Six is the abducens nerve, more eyeball movement and mechanoreception. So the reason for the cardinal fields of gaze test and having the person move their eyeballs in different directions is different cranial nerves are going to control different muscles on the eye and move it in different directions. So it's a way to check and make sure that they are all working properly. The facial nerve, this is going to be involved with facial expression. Taste, it's going to be taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Mechanoreception, tears, and saliva. Eight is the vestibular cochlear nerve. It's going to have the cochlear portion that's involved with hearing, and the vestibular portion is involved with your equilibrium. Nine is glossopharyngeal. Glosso means tongue, pharynx is your throat. This is going to control taste to the posterior one-third of your tongue. This is also where the gag reflex is. Interestingly enough, on the posterior one-third of your tongue is where you're going to most strongly perceive bitter flavors. And a lot of the bitter alkaloids in the plant world are actually poisonous. So it kind of helps to gag you when you put those things in your mouth. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve. So this is that cranial portion of the parasympathetics here. 11 is the accessory nerve. It's also known as the spinal accessory nerve. It's going to control the head and shoulder muscles and mechanoreception to that area. 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. It's going to control speech and swallowing. If somebody is not able to produce speech, it is possible that they aren't going to be able to safely swallow as well. So with our sensation, we have general senses and special senses. General senses can be done all over the body. They don't have a special sensory receptor. They would include things like tactile, which is touch, pressure and vibration, itch, pain, thermal, mechanoreception. You can do that all over the body. One of the features of these is they will undergo adaptation. You'll have decreased sensation with prolonged stimulation. If you've ever had your glasses on your head and you're wondering where you put them because you just don't longer feel them. This is why you generally don't notice your jewelry that you're wearing. You usually won't perceive your clothes being on your body at the end of the day. It's a way for the brain to filter out stimulation that it just doesn't really need to dedicate the energy to anymore. So somatic sensations are ones that we're consciously aware of. They are your general sensations they can be mapped out on the cerebral cortex using a motor or sensory map. Sometimes they'll draw it out to represent a little body laying over the brain with a homunculus. Visceral sensations are going to report the conditions within the body. You don't have a lot of conscious awareness over these. If you think about it, if you poke yourself with a pin on the finger, you can identify exactly where the pain is. If you have visceral pain, it's much harder to pinpoint and describe exactly what that pain is like. We don't have a whole lot of pain receptors in that area, but we do have a lot of receptors taking care of other things like when and how you're going to digest your food. So looking at the tactile senses or touch, we've got the Meisner's corpuscles. These are going to be responsible for touch in the dermal papillae. So we talked about those already in the skin. The Merkel's discs are the type 1 cutaneous mechanoreceptors. They're located in the stratum basale of the epidermis. So more touch. And then one that is new is the Ruffini corpuscle. So we have not talked about this one yet is why it's new. Type 2 cutaneous mechanoreceptors. It's in the deep dermis of the skin. So the Pacinian corpuscles, these will sense pressure and vibration. 
So itch, this is perceived by free nerve endings. Free nerve endings don't really have any specialization, so they can be used for pain, thermal sensation, itch, tickle, and some touch. So thermal sensations are just warm and cold using those free nerve endings. With pain, we use nociceptors or free nerve endings for pain. Nociception means pain. Referred pain can be kind of confusing for people. It's pain felt in an area overlying an organ distant from the stimulated organ. Where you feel the pain is not where the source of the pain is. And a lot of times a person will be like, well, that's not where it's hurting. That's not where it's hurting. And usually when you can explain to them and get them to understand this concept that we know with the heart, it can refer pain to the jaw or into the arms. Those aren't even really close to the heart. So that's the idea with referred pain. We think there may be some embryological connections from how the tissue migrated as to why we have these patterns. We're not 100% sure on them. Fast pain is a rapid, acute, sharp, prickling pain, where slow pain is a dull, gradual, increasing, chronic, throbbing type pain. One other kind of pain that's not listed on here, but people are generally interested in, is phantom pain. Phantom pain is having pain in a body part you no longer have. So if somebody's had a body part amputated, that part of the brain is not amputated. The brain can still actually perceive things in there. And it isn't always just pain. It may be that they would have something itch. It's really frustrating for them because if your left arm itches and you don't have a left arm anymore, there really isn't anything you can do to soothe that either. But we have learned about some other neurons that are mirror neurons and sympathy neurons from looking at ways to try and help these people. So mechanoreception or proprioception, it's your joint position sense. You know where your body parts are relative to other parts of your body. So your special senses, these are going to require a special sensory organ. They're all on your head. Sight, sound, taste, smell, and equilibrium. So olfaction is your sense of smell. The olfactory bulb here is going to go from your nose and it will extend back below the frontal lobes. Your olfactory tract will go back to the primary olfactory area, which is in the medial temporal lobe and it's going to be closely tied to emotions, memory. Pheromones are going to be ones that cause attraction and then excitement. So what happens is when you smell things, they are aerosolized molecules, they're chemicals, that will trigger certain patterns in, patterns in these cilia in the mucosa. These are cilia, they are not nose hairs. You'll stimulate that particular pattern and it will send that information up along the neuron to the olfactory nerve, and then it will pass that on to the brain. So as humans, our sense of smell is not great. A lot of times we can look at something like an air freshener that smells like a strawberry, and to you and I, you go, oh yeah, it smells like strawberries. There's actually no strawberry in it in a lot of cases. Your dog, on the other hand, does not think that smells like a strawberry. They have many more receptors here and can tell the difference in here. Think of it almost like notes on a keyboard. You got the little kid's piano that has eight notes. The dog got the full-size piano. So that's why we will use animals to sniff out bombs, drugs, various other things. They can actually even smell certain diseases in people where we just do not have the sensory receptors for that as humans. So taste or gustation, there are four primary types of taste buds that we have, sour, bitter, sweet, and salty. And then we also have one called umami, which is picking up savory flavors. Those would be flavors of things like meat, cheese, mushrooms. They're actually the things that are enhanced by MSG. So where these are distributed on the tongue is different. Sweet is more on the tip of the tongue. Bitter is on the posterior aspect of the tongue. 
salty and sour are along the sides. So I've seen some textbooks that will put salty and sour both on the sides. Some separate salty to the side and put sour in the middle. So again, with the gustatory pathway, the food is going to stimulate a unique pattern of those gustatory receptors that's going to send that electric signal that's going to be in a unique pattern for that particular taste and a nerve impulse. So we're not particularly great at tasting the differences in things. So sometimes with food, when you taste it, you go, something is off, but I can't tell what it is. We don't have the detail in our receptors to be able to tell those slight differences always. We can also have taste be influenced by certain smells in the area because the cavity, your oral cavity, is connected with the nasal cavity. So for vision, your lacrimal gland is going to secrete tears. It's in the upper lateral part of the eyelid, so when it's working over time, that's why your eyes get puffy. The lacrimal duct is going to open to the surface of the eyelid. It starts on the lateral surface, and then it's going to drain medially into the nasal lacrimal duct, and that will drain into the nasal cavity. Most of the time, what drains into there is going to evaporate before it gets to your nose. However, if you're crying, what's going to happen is your nose is going to start running eventually because you're going to have a lot more liquid coming down into that duct. When you exceed that, what that duct can carry, then the tears spill over onto the face. Tears will have lysozyme in there to help kill bacteria. The eyeball has three layers or tunics. A fibrous layer, vascular layer, and nerve layer. So your cornea, it's labeled on this picture as being over this part of the eye, but really to be able to see it, you've got to look at it on this view. It's this bubble here that you see. It's a fibrous transparent coat over the iris. The iris is the colored part. This is the area that can get cataracts. The conjunctiva is going to line the eyelid in the anterior surface of the eye. So it can line the eyelid, it folds back, comes over and around the eye, and then back up again. So conjunctivitis is inflammation of it. Pink eye can cause that. The conjunctiva can become really irritated with allergies as well, and you'll see it swell. The sclera is the white of the eye. So over here on the sides, that would be the sclera. It's fibrous, dense, connective tissue. It helps to give the eye shape. And then the retina is the actual nerve layer here on the back. It's going to be the inner coat that lines the posterior surface of the eye. That's the actual sensory organ. Your choroid is the vascular layer. It's a thin membrane lining the internal surface of the sclera. And then the retina sits on top of this choroid. So when a person's eyes are bloodshot, what you're seeing is some of those blood vessels in the choroid be broken. The lens is the transparent part that's going to focus light on the retina. A lot of times people think this is the lens out here. That's the cornea. Deeper in, you have the lens. So when the image is going to come through, it's going to bend the light at 90 degrees, so the image is projected upside down onto the retina. So the iris is the colored part of the eye. It's going to have circular and radial muscles. It will determine how much light enters the eye. If you've looked at the iris of a camera, you can see how it, that hole will get bigger and smaller. The pupil is the hole in the center of the iris of the eye. So for our sensory cells, we've got rods and cones. Rods are going to be for the grayscale. They'll give you your black and white vision. These are going to be what you have to rely on in dim light. They'll give visual acuity. They're going to sense movements a lot better. If you see something out of the corner of your eye, you perceive some movement there. It was the rods that picked that up. The cones are for color vision, and those are going to be 
three different types. It's similar to the three primary colors, but we call them cyan, yellow, green, and magenta. The fovea centralis is a small depression of the center of the retina. That's where the cones are most concentrated, so you're going to see color best right in front of you. The optic disc, this is where you've got axons of the cell extend into a small area of the retina. It's almost like a seam there that's going to form a blind spot because that's where the nerve fibers are connecting and you don't actually have sensory cells there. The vitreous body, this is a clear jelly-like substance in the inner eye. So with light, you will have refraction anytime it goes through a different substance. It bends light a little bit. If you've been in the water and you open your eyes, you'll notice that your hands look really big in the water. It's bending of light that causes that to happen. So accommodation is an increase in the curve of the lens for near vision. So to be able to focus on things, you need to be able to change how much that lens is curved to help focus things close up or farther away. Convergence, this is going to allow the automatic movement of the eyeballs towards the midline. So that's also important for being able to focus on things together. For the visual pathway, we're just going to briefly touch on it here. But there should be some additional things that are actually in your online classroom for going through this with some other drawings. Basically, you have the eye out in front of you here. With your eye, it's going to have your visual fields. You have a left lateral and medial visual field and a right medial and lateral visual field. The information will come back and the eyeball is going to see what is at 90 degrees to it and it will go into the retina. From there it's going to travel back through the optic nerve. The medial fibers of the optic nerve are going to cross. We, the term we use for nerve fibers crossing is decussate. The lateral fibers are going to come down onto the same side. So that means what this eye is seeing is right here. What this eye seen is right here and over here. So your visual fields will actually be split because of it. So before they cross, it's the optic nerve. Where they cross is the optic chiasm. After they cross, it's the optic tract. So the next thing they're going to do is pass through the thalamus and then through the optic radiations and back to the occipital lobe. So that's the main pathway in there. Again, I would encourage you to look in the online classroom for the additional information on the visual pathway that will help it make more sense. So this one also shows the visual pathway. I like this picture a little bit better because you can see over here, this part of the eye is actually seeing what's the right eyeball is actually seeing what's on the left side here. The left eyeball seeing what's on the right side of the image. So for the ear, we divide it into three regions, the outer, middle, and inner ear. The job of the outer ear is to collect sound waves. So this part you see on the outside is the auricle. It's basically skin over cartilage. Um, if you poke a hole in it, it may bleed and it's not going to feel good. So when you pierce it, you can feel it. The EAM is your external auditory meatus. It's going to be the opening that will allow you to go from the auricle to the eardrum or tympanic membrane. Along the way, you have the cerumen or earwax. Your tympanic membrane here is going to be vibrated by sound waves. In your middle ear, you're going to have the auditory or eustachian tube. This is going to connect the ear to the throat. So when there is a pressure change out here, by moving around your jaw, you can pop this tube open a little bit, and it will allow the pressure to come in through your mouth 
and be equal on the other side. So when your ears are popping, that's what's happening is you're balancing the pressure between the middle ear and the outer ear. So this would also allow sometimes fluid can get in here. It's more of a problem with young children, especially when they are teething and can cause inflammation in there. That's otitis media. When it happens out here, this is what you would be, it would be more likely an adult to be otitis externa or swimmer's ear. You get water out here stuck in the ear. So what happens when you have moisture sitting on something like that is the tissue is going to become raw and uncomfortable. So the ossicles are the little bones in here. They're the malleus, incus, and stapes. They're going to transfer the vibration to the oval window. The oval window is going to be the opening in the partition between the middle and inner ear. So then we move here to the inner ear. And you can see these structures here. You've got these semicircular canals that run in the X, Y, and Z axis. And then these utricle and saccule that we're going to be using for balance. So you have a bony labyrinth in there. It's going to have the cochlea and then the vestibule where you'll have the semicircular canals. This is going to be where you have sound and balance perception. You have a membranous labyrinth, which is a series of sacs and tubes that are inside the bony labyrinth. You're going to have endolymph inside of there. So perilymph is going to fill the structures of the bony labyrinth. So endolymph is within the membranous portion. Between the bony and membrane, membranous portion, you'll have the perilymph. And it's continuous with the cerebral spinal fluid. So your vestibule is an oval-shaped area in the middle of the bony labyrinth that's going to have your utricle and saccule. So your utricle and saccule you're going to use for static equilibrium. They're going to tell you what position your head is in. Inside they're lined with hair cells that are little sensory cells on the otolithic membrane. It's going to have little otoliths, which literally means ear stones. They're made up of calcium carbonate. They're going to float on the surface. Gravity is going to pull them over to the lowest spot over the membranes and where they st stimulate the membranes will give you the information to know what position your head is in. So if you tip your head to the side, the little bones or the little stones have to move and they'll stimulate a different part of that otolithic membrane. So most of the time that functions pretty well. Occasionally they will stick in an area and not move and can contribute to vertigo, which is really unpleasant for a person. So for dynamic equilibrium, we have the semicircular canals. These are the ones running in the X, Y, and Z axis. So those hair cells are going to be the sensory cells that are going to perceive movement of the fluid. The fluid in there is called the cupola. It's a gelatinous material. So it will actually have a little bit of a delay in the movement. So if you are spinning around and you stop, little kids will do this, you'll actually feel like you're kind of moving around a little bit because of the slowness of the cupola moving down. So your cochlea is a snail shell shaped spiral canal in the bone. It's going to contain the organ of cordy. And then you have the round window that's going to allow sound waves to exit. The organ of cordy is your actual organ of hearing. It's going to have little ciliated receptor cells on the membrane inside the cochlea. So what will happen is the sound waves will come in and they will stimulate particular patterns on the organ of cordy. So there are sounds that we cannot hear where the waves are just too big to fit in the ears or they are so small that they never actually hit any of those receptor cells. So when those receptor cells are damaged, they do not grow back and do not work, and you can end up with hearing damage. So hearing damage does happen pretty easily. Um, most movie theaters, the sound is actually loud enough to cause hearing damage in two hours. So the pattern things come in. Sound waves will come in through the EAM. They'll vibrate the tympanic membrane. That will get transferred through the malleus, incus, and stapes to the oval window. Vibrate the perilymph and go in through the round window into the cochlear duct. 
and stimulate that pattern on the basilar membrane in the organ of corti. And then cranial nerve eight will deliver that to the temporal lobe. For equilibrium, cranial nerve eight is also going to take that information to the brain stem and the cerebellum, you know, particularly into the medulla oblongata, and it's going to coordinate the information with input from the eyes, mechanoreceptors, what your static and dynamic equilibrium say is going on. So when a person has motion sickness, there's disagreement in there. So when you have motion sickness, the best bet is to try and get as much agreement with that information as possible. So if you're in a moving vehicle, get to the front seat, look out the front window. For a lot of people reading, your eyes will be perceiving that you're not moving if you're reading. If you look out the window, out straight out in front of you, and you can see that you're moving, it will help. Um, there are medications that can be taken prior to motion sickness starting. Once motion sickness starts, the medication is generally not real helpful. So if you've had motion sickness, you know it's a pretty miserable thing. So this is the end of the section on the nervous system.